Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Dr. Kara Wada. I'm an allergist, immunologist, lifestyle medicine doc. And maybe more importantly for this session, I'm also a fellow patient navigating the unpredictable world of autoimmune disease. And today we are taking a it's part two of this deep dive into the connection that many physicians miss the link between Sjogren's disease and dysautonomia. Now, if you missed part one, no problem. You're gonna hit pause. You're gonna go back to see all, all about like what is dysautonomia? What does that mean? How is it related to Sjogren's? What are the signs and symptoms? Today's session, we're gonna talk about action. What do we do if you have Sjogren's and you are dealing with the dizziness, the fainting, the digestive issues, temperature issues where it feels like your body's thermostat is completely gone haywire. I really think that this series of videos last week and this week is truly gonna be life-changing for so many of you. And I have both Sjogren's and dysautonomia. For years, I dealt with symptoms that seemed completely unrelated to this dryness disease. I had racing heart when I'd stand up, I'd get dizzy if I like squatted down to play with my kids and stood back up. Lots of digestive issues that we won't get into the nitty gritty. Frankly, it's a little TMI. And continue to deal with some of these issues with temperature and tolerance. I was living with all these symptoms while seeing patients, while being a mom, and I've seen countless patients in my clinical practice with Sjogren's patients, dysautonomia patients, being told that their dizziness is just dehydration, their digestive problems are, it's IBS, we can't do anything about it, or their fatigue is just what they have to deal with because they have an autoimmune disease. And let's talk about some much more specific, both the explanation in part one and more importantly, what can we do to move the dial to decrease how much these symptoms are truly impacting our everyday lives as we wake up in the morning, we try to get out of bed, try to be a contributing member of our family in our workplace, if we're still able to work all these things Let's understand better what's happening in your body and what we can do about it from a treatment standpoint. Let's talk initially about some of the things we can do and, and the set the stage. So I really want to think about all of the, the factors that come into this perfect storm that causes dysautonomia in relationship to Sjogren's disease. And frankly, we are still trying to fully understand the, the science behind what is going on. We know that Sjogren's patients are often affected with neurologic problems, problems with our nervous system. And those problems can occur anywhere along the path of the nerves from the really tiny small fiber nerves that are found the tips of our fingers and our toes and everywhere else, all the way back to our central nervous system, the brain. And you can see issues related to dysfunction anywhere in that path. And so we need to think about things, where are they occurring? Where are they originating? How can we turn down inflammation? And also what are just some great practical tools of, hey, this is where my system is, where it is functioning now and dysfunctioning now. How can I use some strategies to work with what I have? So here are some non-medication interventions. And again, these are things that are foundational that many of you may talk about with your cardiologist, your neurologist, whoever is maybe overseeing your dysautonomia care. If you are so lucky to have someone on your team that has expertise in that, you do need to run any of these things by your personal healthcare team. Because although I am a doctor, I am not your doctor in this YouTube context because that is just not cool. Okay, so number one is we can work on our fluid and salt management. Now, I met my husband in medical school. He happens to be a cardiologist. So we're recording this while he isn't home because I'm joking. But he tends to tell people to eat a low salt diet, right? That's what we learn is helpful, especially for people with high blood pressure. If you have low blood pressure or an inability to regulate where the fluid is in your body, often we're making the opposite recommendation. We are saying, hey, add two to three grams of salt a day. Just a lot. Increase your water intake to two to three liters a day, unless there are other reasons like issues with your heart or lungs that would say that's not a good idea or kidneys too. We often will say, hey, it is worth using some electrolyte supplements, especially if it's hot 
or you are in a situation where you're more dehydrated. We also will tend to say, hey, we need to think about alcohol and caffeine with with moderation in mind and or sometimes for many people even just avoiding them because they can worsen those symptoms that occur. They're called orthostatic symptoms, symptoms that occur when you change position. There also are some physical strategies. These include wearing compression garments. Often we'll talk about compression stockings that are 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. That's how tight they are. And those can help return blood flow to your heart. Often we need to use socks that aren't just knee high, that aren't just thigh high. Many times patients with significant dysautonomia need to wear stockings that go all the way from their feet, all the way up to their torso. There also are some physical counter maneuvers crossing your legs, tensing your muscles, those sorts of things that can also help increase blood flow back up to your brain and help you if you are feeling like you're gonna pass out. When you are changing positions, take your time. Don't jump out of bed, move more slowly, give your body that extra time to get that that signal from point A to point B and point A again. Exercise and movement are also critical. It is a pillar of lifestyle medicine, and often we will use a graded approach when we are thinking about how we're going to rebuild someone's strength and endurance when they have suffered a setback with their dysautonomia. Most often, I'm going to work with a physical therapist, a personal trainer, someone with an exercise physiologist. All of these folks are great team members to help us work on a comprehensive approach. Often it will start with exercises that are done more horizontal, like a recumbent bike. And usually then we will gradually, gradually, gradually build to upright exercise as tolerated. We also want to focus on leg strengthening that helps improve blood flow and blood return to the heart. And really thinking about working with a physical therapist and exercise therapist familiar with dysautonomia or if you're someone who also suffers from hypermobility, can really be a game changer. All right, so what are some symptomatic medications that one of the physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants on your team may think about adding to your regimen? These tend to be prescription-based medications. There are some that we'll briefly touch on that may fall into that over-the-counter category, but sometimes we'll think about fludrocortisone, helps you retain salt and water, Midadrine, which constricts blood vessels, can improve blood pressure. Beta blockers can help regulate your heart rate, so it's more like a metronome. These are used with caution, but can be quite helpful. For gastrointestinal symptoms, sometimes we'll use agents that will move things along, or we'll adjust the diet, so smaller, more frequent meals, avoiding meals that are super high in fat or super high in carbohydrates and using sometimes digestive enzymes to help with digestion when autonomic function is impaired. For those neuropathic symptoms, one thing, a tool that is a newer tool in my toolbox that's been quite helpful is using low doses of naltrexone, which is an opioid receptor blocker, and that can help kind of downregulate inflammation, but kind of reset some of the, the neurologic aspects to the physiology going on. We also think about things like gabapentin, low-dose tricyclics. All of these can be helpful, but they need to be used with a very thoughtful approach because they do have significant potential for side effects, some medication interactions, and also, especially for patients with Sjogren's, can sometimes increase drying and dryness symptoms, which is certainly the case with some of the tricyclics. All right, so let's think about the immune system because it's the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, the immune system, all these things are coming into play. How can we address those driving factors? One of the treatments that is sometimes used, especially in neurosjogrens, is rituximab. It depletes our B cells, which are some of the cells that are factories for autoantibodies. And this is used in more severe cases of Sjogren's that have more systemic manifestations, lots of glandular swelling and significant neurologic impact. Additionally, some healthcare teams will think about using high dose intravenous immunoglobulin, also known as IVIG. And this is an increasingly looked at option for people with severe autonomic neuropathy. And so 
This, again, is something that needs to be talked about with your rheumatologist, your immunologist, your neurologist who has experience in using this treatment modality. It can be very helpful, but it needs to be considered in a thoughtful way because there are significant side effects that need to be discussed. And then we have our traditional disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. We have things like hydroxychloroquine, also known as Plaquenil, which currently is our go-to kind of first-line treatment for Sjogren's disease, though it is not FDA-approved for that condition. We also have mycophenolate, azathioprine, corticosteroids for acute flares. This is, though, where I think our current state of research and clinical trials is so exciting because we have a lot of new treatments that are in the pipeline specifically targeting Sjogren's inflammation. And I will be so curious to see in future follow-up studies Do patients have any improvement in their neurologic symptoms when they are put on these immune modulating treatments? The hope would be yes, but we don't know that information yet. The key really is to finding a healthcare professional who understands dysautonomia, who understands Sjogren's, and or is willing to learn because there is so much to learn and recognizes that this isn't just a collection of separate symptoms. It's often, most often, a manifestation of the same processes that's affecting your glands that is also affecting your neurologic system. So how do you create a personalized management plan? I think managing dysautonomia in any patient, and especially Sjogren's patients, needs to be highly individualized. And here's how I approach it. We want to start with the basics. The basics are basic because they tend to get us the most bang for our buck. They're the most well studied, they tend to be things that also have a lower risk associated with them. So hydration and salt management, compression garments, positional strategies, raising the head of the bed when you're asleep, 10 to 30% can be huge. Graduated exercise programs. The thing is these aren't super sexy, right? But putting in the reps of doing these day after day after day after day after day after day after day really can benefit us over the long term. And then we can layer in other symptomatic treatments, working with our healthcare professional team, targeting often our most troublesome symptoms first. And what's really hard is we have to be patient. It often takes time and takes experimentation to figure out what the right combination is. It's also really important to know that dysautonomia will often evolve and change over time. And so what's the right combination today or this month may look different six months or 12 months from now. Keeping detailed records of what helps and what doesn't help can be really important as you are working through things in a methodical way. You also can talk with your team about possibility of using or changing your immune modulating therapies. If these conservative measures aren't enough, this is when this should come into the conversation and you need to find someone who is experienced with these therapies and or who is willing and able to reach out to those within the community that are. This also requires patience. Many of these medications do take time to see their full effect in the order sometimes of three to six months to see the full effect. We also need to address other conditions that come along with Sjogren's and come along with dysautonomia. These are called comorbid conditions. And this really can help optimize your overall treatment. If you have bad allergies, let's work on turning down that inflammation. If you have a sleep disorder, gosh, that's huge. We need to get you restful, restorative sleep. That is how your brain cleans out the the garbage from the day is through the lymphatics in our brain. And that process happens while we're asleep. And we need to fill our toolbox with strategies that align with us and feel good for us to manage stress. Stress is a part of our experience as humans. Suffering is a part of our experience as humans. And learning to understand that and to address that in productive and helpful ways so that we recognize and honor those stressors, but are able to respond rather than react. Gosh, that is, for me, that has been one of the biggest game changers in my health Um, overall. So I want you to realize and recognize that having dysautonomia, having Sjogren's disease does not mean you cannot live a full life or an active life. It means you need to be smarter about how you manage your body, how you advocate for appropriate care. And as someone who's living with both conditions, I can tell you that understanding this connection, getting proper treatment 
And working on these lifestyle aspects has made a tremendous difference in my quality of life. My ability to be a partner with my husband, to be a parent to my three young children, to be a daughter to my aging parents, to be a physician and advocate for my patients. The key to understanding that this isn't separate from your Sjogren's and that it's part of the same disease process allows you to really think about how we treat it comprehensively, addressing both the inflammatory autoimmune component and the symptomatic management, the neurologic component. When we put all these puzzle pieces together, we really can move the dial and seeing significant improvement over time. I've experienced this improvement myself. I've seen it in countless patients that I've helped care for. So some practical tips for your daily life. Plan your day around your energy patterns. Stay ahead of your symptoms. Don't wait until you're feeling awful to implement management strategies. Educate your support system about these connections and connect with others who understand that both Sjogren's and dysautonomia are part and parcel for many of us. That support system can be huge. You're not alone in this journey. You can join our free Facebook communities where we discuss these complex manifestations of autoimmune disease. We have the links below. You'll find others who understand the frustration of having symptoms dismissed and the relief of finally getting answers. If you're in one of the states I'm licensed in, you're looking for comprehensive care that addresses all aspects of your Sjogren's and dysautonomia, I'd love to work with you. You can check out information at the Immune Confident Institute, my medical practice. I want you to remember your symptoms are real. They are connected. They are treatable. Don't let anyone tell you that your dizziness, your digestive issues, your fatigue are just part of the deal without exploring whether dysautonomia might be involved and how we might address it. You deserve comprehensive care that addresses all aspects of your condition in your life. Keep advocating for yourself. Keep learning and know that better days are possible with the right approach. What questions do you have about dysautonomia, about Sjogren's disease? Have you experienced these connections in your own health journey? Share your experiences in the comments below and your story might help someone else that realize that they're not alone. Before we wrap up, I want to share some exciting news and an important update about my private practice, the Immune Confident Institute. It has been an incredible nearly six months since we opened our virtual doors, and I am so grateful for the amazing community we're building. We've been listening to your feedback, and one thing has become crystal clear. That initial period after your first visit can be a time of anxiety and so many questions. So we're enhancing our new patient experience to provide more dedicated support right from the start. Starting September 1st, all new patient evaluations will now include a complimentary one month of our Immune Confident Institute membership access. This means you get seamless support from our team to bridge that critical gap between your first visit and your follow-up so you never feel alone. To support this enhanced level of care, our pricing for new patient evaluations will be updated on September 1st. But for everyone who's been thinking about joining us, I wanted to give you an opportunity. If you book your new patient evaluation anytime in August, you can lock in our legacy pricing before that change takes effect. It's my way of saying thank you for being a part of this journey with me. So if you're ready to take that next step and get a personalized roadmap for your health, now is the perfect time. You can find more information and book your consult in the description below. Until next time, take care.